Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 181 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, we have a very special guest on the show, Danny Glover. Now, this is not the actor Danny Glover. This is the DWI master Danny Glover. Danny brings nearly three decades of DWI trial war stories and experience into his uh, episode today, and I am so, so excited to talk to the OBX lawyer, Danny Glover, on today's show. We had a blast of a conversation. Really hope that you get as much out of it as I did. Danny, it is a real treat and pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, hu- huge fan of the OBX lawyer. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to have uh, have some some East Carolina perspective on the podcast. I feel like we're we're not getting enough of like that side of the state's perspective on the on the podcast calls, just because I don't have as many connections. Um, down, down that direction. So, so very excited to kind of get, you know, every, every County is its own universe. So we're going to get to, to maybe feel a little bit of that on today's call, but again, very excited to have you, uh, have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Danny, I, I kind of just wanted to start with a few background, um, questions. So in terms of kind of, uh, who you are. Tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Where, where, why did you kind of ultimately go into, into law school, into criminal defense? What was like the, the attraction to, to the DWI defense side of things? I'm so old, Jake, that I don't hardly remember back that far <laughs> as to how and why I ended up here. But uh, uh, I, uh, I grew up in Kentucky, the son of a preacher. And uh, then when I went to undergrad, my parents moved to the Durham Chapel Hill area where they've been since 1988. And so when I finished undergrad in 92, uh, I qualified for in-state tuition to Chapel Hill. And so I ended up going to law school there. Um, and, and honestly, I never grew up wanting to be a lawyer. It was never a lifelong dream. It was just, um, you know, when I graduated undergrad, it felt like the next thing I needed to do was go to grad school. And uh, I had done well in some fields that lent it, lent themselves to being an attorney. So I was told. And so I just started applying to law schools and I happened to be fortunate enough to get accepted to Chapel Hill and uh, went there. And I was there from 92 to 95. And I think there... I realized I did not want to be a corporate lawyer. I couldn't stand all the tax codes and that kind of thing. <laughs> and I had grown up an athlete and, and a highly competitive personality. And uh, on top of all that, I, I got hooked up with a professor there named Rich Rosen, who oh, wow. was one of the godfathers of criminal defense and yeah. civil rights kind of stuff. And I actually clerked for him one summer as his research clerk and uh, got into some very interesting criminal defense uh, research projects and then uh, went to the uh, trial ad. Uh, we basically had a school there, a clinic, where we could actually practice law in Orange County under the supervision of uh, some some uh, professors and uh, I did is, is that. that in the uh courthouse that's like kind of on the campus or is that uh no no we actually went that you're talking about the one on franklin street yep. and we didn't go there we went down to hillsborough okay and, and we we did our cases and there was nothing earth shattering there but we appeared in front of a judge and we had to do paperwork with the clerks and we had to you know, get just a small taste of it, but it was enough that uh, when I when I got into my second year, um, I was um, began 
doing applications for 2L clerkships, uh, trying to get into a criminal defense setting. And I hooked up with a guy in Elizabeth City who brought me up for my second year. And he was a former prosecutor and did a lot of DWI work and a lot of criminal defense stuff uh, in the Elizabeth City Outer Banks area. And so before I went back for my third year, uh, he had offered me a full-time position after I graduated. And so I didn't even bother applying to other places my third year. I barely <laughs> bothered to go to class my third year <laughs> since I already had a job lined up. So uh, we, uh, I ended up- You do uh, not hear many lawyers that have that like after after law school job, like ready to go. I think I think most of us were sweating it out after. <laughs> I, was very, I was very, very fortunate. And so I uh, graduated and I took the bar and I got married three days later. And then I uh, was here in Elizabeth City working full time two weeks after that. And I've uh, been here since uh, the fall of 95. And uh, my practice has included um, significant personal injury cases. Um, I don't do a high volume of that, but I've done those for 28 years now and uh, tend to to only keep 20 or 30 cases going at a time. And they're the, you know, the higher dollar severe injury type cases. And then uh, criminal defense of all kinds, traffic tickets to murder, to uh, sex offenses, but my bread and butter uh, is DWI work, and I work uh, from Williamston up to Ahoski, down to Ocracoke, and all points east of that, about 14 counties, including three separate judicial districts, uh, the first district, the second district, and the sixth district, and uh, so I get to work with a lot of different judges, a lot of different prosecutors, each each judicial district has its own rules and conflict procedures and filing procedures and things like that. But it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy uh, being different places every day. I can't imagine the, the lawyers who go to the same courthouse and see the same prosecutors every single day. Uh, but, you know, we're so rural. Yeah, you're, ta you're taking Road Warrior to like a whole new level. I mean, we were yeah. talking about this before the call, but there's no easy way to get to some of those courthouses out there. Yeah, so. There's not. You know, I could be I could be three hours apart on the extreme someday and have to be in both courts. And oh, that man. that gets challenging. But <laughs> yeah. we have very, you know, as opposed to the horror stories I hear from the big cities, we, you know, we have very reasonable judges, very reasonable prosecutors. No one. Uh, yanks my chain too hard. Of course, I try not to give them a reason to. <laughs> yeah, that's but, a, that's uh, the uh, uh, you know it's it's interesting. We're so rural that a lot of our counties uh, only have court once a week. Some of those very smaller counties have gone not even to court once a week. They might only have two district court sessions a month, and so uh, and then you know like Dare and Pasquotank. They they'll have two or three a week, uh, so every every county has its own little quirks and and special nuances. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, couple of a uh, couple of things. I think you did it right on the on the marriage front, getting married after passing the bar. So I, I got married two days after going into law school, uh, which was not the uh, I had orientation, then literally like. Two days later, got married. Two days later, started started law school like officially. So it was <laughs> that was a bad decision. I would not recommend doing that. But doing it on the back end is the the, the right way to go. And then I love I love the uh, comment about the the corporate law in law school. I can I learned two things when I was in tax class. One was that I was going to need a really good accountant, and second was that I did not want to do tax law. So that was like the uh, that was the lessons that came out of out of that particular subject. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's DWI is just such a, uh, a fun, fun area to, to practice. And I, I think it's just uh, uh, helpful in terms of, of kind of like, you know, uh, how do you kind of get things kind of off the ground, so to speak, with a with a client? So when somebody calls in on a DWI, maybe this this actually might vary a little bit just based on the amount of ground that you that you cover. 
what does kind of that that uh, initial phone call and um, consultation and and kind of you know uh, next steps? What what are some of the uh, 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 kind of action steps that you're giving during that initial consultation? Sure, sure. We you know it's changed a lot over the 28 years I've been doing this. In the beginning, uh, our practice and and this is remember now in 1995. The internet was dial up and it was basically, you know, Yahoo. And uh, so the 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 idea of searching the internet to find a lawyer didn't exist. And so our practice was primarily a local practice and uh, we didn't get a whole lot of tourists. uh, And so all of my consultations were in person. Uh, now, my practice has evolved to where more than 50% of my clientele are uh, don't live in this area, and they find me on the internet uh, somehow or another, and they uh, so the consultations are by phone call. But typically, what we do, we have an intake sheet that can be accessed electronically by the client. Uh, they fill it out. Uh, on that intake sheet, I'm asking not only biographical questions, but questions about the incident uh, to alert me to potential grossly aggravating factors or aggravating factors. Uh, and so I, I kind of know those things before I ever speak to the client. And then once we have all of their paperwork and the intake sheet filled out, uh, I, I call them and uh, go over some some basic stuff. But, but then I just, you know, simply ask them, all right, now I want you to start at the beginning uh, and tell me where you'd been, what you'd had to drink, where you were headed and what happened. And then I just turn them loose and then I interrupt them as needed um, to, to get the information that I need. Um, understanding, and I explain this to them, that, you know, at some point in our three districts that I work, uh, we have free discovery. So mm-hmm. the prosecutor gives us everything they have uh, from uh, written notes, witness statements, videos, uh, doesn't matter. Now, the videos differ. You know, the highway patrols running dash cams. Certain counties are running body cams. Certain counties don't have anything. Certain counties have only certain officers who have cameras. Uh, so it, it, it's, what it varies is- by can- Sorry, just to interrupt real quick, what, what is the typical time frame that you get that discovery back? It depends on the judicial district. In the first district, which is what people normally consider the Outer Banks, it does not include Ocracoke, but it's Nags Head, uh, Manio, Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk, Curry Tuck, Kerala Duck. That judicial district, which extends through Elizabeth City over to Edenton, that's all digitized. And so... Mm-hmm. Typically, within a few weeks, we get a notification from the DA that our discovery is ready and wow, we can awesome. go download it. That does not include intoxilizer room videos. We have to get those directly from um, the sheriff's departments who, who are running the intoxilizer rooms. Now, the sixth and the second, uh, they do it a little different. They email it to us when we ask for it. Um, our In the first district, Again, Elizabeth City, Edenton, Outer Banks, our chief district court judge has issued an order outlining various time frames for the resolution of a DWI. Mm. If it's a non-blood case, if it's a blood case involving alcohol, or if it's a blood case involving non-alcohol, prescription meds, illegal meds, things like that. And those all have different time frames, but that order requires the DA to... Uh, send us the link to the discovery without us ever asking for it. So it happens mm-hmm. as soon as we make a general appearance uh, in the case, they are to release the discovery to us. In the second and the sixth districts at this point, we have to ask for it. And uh, so because of that, and and I don't know if every attorney asked for it, but I certainly do, um, their officers don't get the discovery turned into the DA's office as quickly as they do in the first district. And that can take um, a lot of follow-up to, to get, to get what I'm looking for. Um, those yeah, I'm, are, I'm, I'm curious. Cause I just, I think, I think at some point it would be, you know, it feels like there's, there's certain places, uh, you know, uh, kind of around our area 
um, that uh, 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 Haywood County right next right next door to to Buncombe where I practice. I mean they they're very fast. You know, typically by the first court date, definitely by the second, they'll have the discovery packet like waiting for um, pickup, and they'll they'll email it to you if you, if you need that. Um, uh, but then, yeah, there's other counties where it's just kind of like you send an email request and then it's kind of lost in the system and you fall back up. So, you know, I, I think at some point it would be helpful to 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 make a collective push on that front in terms of just trying to figure out the, the places that are getting it back quickly. Likely it's benefiting everybody in terms of timeframes and, and, you know, alleviating the DA's headache because it's like, we got to have a system in order to respond to this many discovery requests. So, um, yeah, it's just interesting to, to kind of see how that's done in different parts of the state. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes that works to our advantage if we don't yeah. have it, you know, yeah. if we needed the, if we need a continuance and, you know, we've can document that we've asked for stuff that we don't have, that typically buys you the continuance. And so I don't, you know, as long as my office stays on top of what we really need, what we really want, and when we want it, uh, you know, it, I'm okay with the DAs dragging their feet, you know, in some instances, because yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if yeah. needed, I can, <laughs> I can use that. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. I, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that that is such a powerful thing, and I love the uh, the intake um, form. I think one thing that's really easy to miss because DWIs are so complex is defenses that might exist, or these you know grossly aggravating factors, aggravating factors. Um, you know, th there's so much uh, information. I feel like that you can get out of the consultation if you're kind of digging into the into the weeds. Um, Obviously, some of these things you can only really figure out once you get the discovery back. But I, I think that having that really dialed in um, intake process with the with the uh, uh, intake form is is super helpful. And, and so again, if anybody is is kind of operating without some sort of like a standardized intake process, that's definitely a kind of key takeaway because there's just so much um, as you as you dive into DWI law, so many things that um, really make a difference in the case that can be, uh, kind of at first glance from the, from the client's mouth. And one of the things that I run into routinely is we have, I have so many tourist DWIs, mm -hmm. people from other States yeah. who come here on vacation, get in trouble, go home that, you know, they may have one or more prior DWIs within the past seven years in another state. And it, it is not, uh, uniform here as to what driving records the the DA's office or law enforcement is going to pull. And so if I have somebody from Massachusetts who tells me they got a DWI two years ago, I have to warn them about, you know, this is a possible, you know, grossly aggravating factor if the DA's office finds out about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's not something I can call the DA's office and say, hey, did you find that DWI in Massachusetts? <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot of sitting and waiting with our fingers crossed that the DA's office is not going to find these out of state records because depending on the agency, depending on, you know, the experience of the officers, sometimes they'll run it. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes yeah. they'll just rely on a North Carolina history. And so, uh, I have a lot of, a lot of situations where, you know, we're just waiting to see if, if something's going to pop up, even though I've known about it for months. Yeah, no, same here. I mean, we have quite a few uh, uh, kind of out of state people in the Asheville area that have come in to to visit the visit Asheville and and kind of take advantage of the mountains and breweries and all, and all that. And it's, I mean, it definitely is that like hit and miss kind of wait and see. Um, I guess to maybe dive into that point a little bit, how do you prepare a client on that front? What does the conversation look like in terms of? Uh, you know, you've got a, a, a possible, you know, level two or level one based on that out of state um, uh, prior, but you're trying to get prepared for court. What does that conversation kind of look like on your end in terms of kind of having the client prepared at the same time for level five and level two, or do you, do you just kind of prepare for level two? What, what does that look like? Yeah, well, I tell them, you know, look, if the state convicts you of this DWI, 
And then if the state proves the existence of this similar DWI in another state, it is an automatic level two or level one, whatever the case may be. And here's what you would face in that instance. But I can't tell you until we get done with the sentencing hearing, whether the state is going to find out about that. Uh, I, in all cases uh, that I'm going to plead um, at some point near the end of the process, I simply ask the prosecutor, does he have a record? Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, and I, that's been my way I've done it for years. Uh, It's completely, you know, run of the mill. There's, you know, I do it with in-state people. I do it with out-of-state people. I do it with people I know have a record. I do it with people I know don't have a record. So I try to, I try to maintain, you know, neutrality on that. So I don't give anything away and and send somebody to the computer at the last minute. Uh, And, you know, that's about all I can do for the out-of-state people that we're talking about now. I don't have to have a limited driving privilege or anything like that for them. So that's, that's not an issue. Uh, and so I, I will have them get an assessment. I will have them, you know, give me a safe driving record if that applies. If someone, you know, had a DWI six years ago, they could still qualify with a safe driving record. And so, uh, you know, very few of our judges asked to actually see their record, uh, but they want they want me to affirmatively tell them that I've seen their record if I'm alleging a safe driving record. Uh, and so that, you know, we just prepare both ways and I tell the client to keep the fingers crossed and, you know, we, we'll go from there. You know, what, what's, what's more interesting than that to me is the level one because of children in the car. Mm-hmm. And so the tourists come in from out of state, uh, they're got the kids in the car, especially teenagers. This is very important with, um, then they get the DWI. And then the family goes back home. Well, the the prosecutor's subpoena power in North Carolina can't drag that family back from Vermont. And so, you know, we just make sure that no one who can testify as to the age of the kids comes back to court with the client. And then we just hope that the officer did not get the ages from the client that night during the during the investigation. There's a lot of times where, in in my experience, the officers will ask the teenagers, how old are you? You know, or they'll ask the mother who's in the passenger seat, how old are you? And they don't get it directly from the defendant. And so, uh, you know, the defense in those cases often isn't to guilt or innocence in the DWI. It's yeah. to making sure the state doesn't introduce that evidence uh, of the age of the kids uh, through through hearsay evidence. Yeah, that's awesome. We I, I just did a podcast probably four or five episodes back on that specific grossly aggravating factor. And um, so I, again, given that you're in, in a space where families are coming and vacationing and, you know, getting this after being on the beach all day, you know, uh, uh, on the way back to the uh, beach house hotel, you know, as they're, as they're traveling home, whatever it might be. Um, uh, with that, with, with regard to that specific issue, um, have you have you litigated uh, uh, at like a sentencing hearing that that issue? And if so, kind of beyond what you just spoke about, is there any any practical tips on that front? Because I do think it's an issue that's under litigated. Yeah, I don't. You know, litigating it would be a stretch. Probably, I, I've never had a jury trial where we've then had you know a, a separate sort of hearing afterwards on this issue. But in district court, you know, I what I try to do is educate the officer in advance of Mm. the hearing look so look officer you know i understand your report says these kids were 16 and 14 my client says he didn't tell you that did you get that from mama did you get that from the kids and if he if he'll tell me that he got it from someone other than my client i'll say to him well you know that's hearsay and they're not here and you know, let's go talk to the prosecutor about it so they understand that, you know, this should not come in. Um, and that typically works. Um, I've never had a contested hearing because, again, we don't have the witnesses there in court. So, right, right. you know, I'm not going to put my client up to 
to be asked how old are your kids? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. No, so, no. I, I, I feel so like that's actually, definitely the safer play. I mean, to just try to get that issue resolved ahead of the sentencing hearing through conversation with the officer and the DA. And I think that that's such a powerful point in terms of going to the officer first, then to the DA on that issue, but on many others as well. I think there's so many times that if you go to the DA first, they go speak with the officer and kind of like get on the same page. You know, it's like, here, here's where, where our, here's where our issue is going to be. Whereas if you go to the officer first, a lot of times they can't see what angle that you're taking. And then they, you know, get locked in, in terms of here's what I'm going, you know, here's what I, what I saw that night here, here's the, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my memory to the best of my recollection. Then you go talk to the, to the DA afterwards. So I, I think that that's a really key point in terms of who to speak with first. Well, and, and it works even better when you've got a motion to suppress with some teeth in it. Mm. And you can start that conversation with the officer by saying, Hey, just a heads up. I filed this motion to suppress because, you know, your HGN wasn't done in accordance with your training or, you know, your search was bad or whatever it is. And, and they're on the defensive and they're worried already. Mm. And then you transition into the kid conversation and you're like, and, you know, really, all I'm really interested in is, you know, if you didn't get the age from my client, then y'all can't use the age. And if that's where we're at, I'll forget about my motion to suppress and we can just, you know, plead it out and take a level five and everybody go home. And that seems to work pretty well. In a I lot love of that. What a, what a great, what a great bargaining tool. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah. So in terms of the intake though, I mean that, you know, you, you got to know, what you're dealing with. I mean, it, it affects, you know, it's one thing to, to defend or try a DWI when there's only a level five on the line and no one's going to jail and, you know, um, it's in, and in Virginia. So we have a lot of border hoppers here come down from Virginia. Virginia won't revoke a license for a North Carolina DWI. And so when I have a, a, a Virginia client, you know, level five simply means 24 hours community service, a couple hundred dollar fine, do your alcohol treatment. And for them, they're not even going to lose their license. And so we're I'm freed up to try a lot more cases than I would try if I know that person is facing a level two or one yeah. or a one and they've got jail time hanging over their head at that point. You know, you, you got to really evaluate the merits of your defense. Is it a Hail Mary or is it like solid versus damage control on the sentence if you think you're going to lose anyway? So knowing that up front, you're able to give a more clear roadmap to the client. And of course, you're able to set your fee better because, you know, if, if I know that this is going to be a plea because of what I'm seeing here, you know, that's a different fee than if I know it's going to be a trial and potentially an appeal and, mm. you know, all that. Yeah, that's great. I think, I mean, that's, it's, uh, <clears throat> the more information I feel like that you can get during the consultation, you know, definitely the better that you can represent the client, the better advice that you can give back to the client, but also, um, uh, you, you know, it, it just builds a level of trust by the fact that you're asking all of these specific questions, you, you know, when you're digging into the, into the weeds, um, I think from the client's perspective, it's like this, this person really knows what they're doing. And hopefully you actually are asking like meaningful questions that make a, make a difference and not doing it just for that sake. But, uh, you know, I do think it from the client's perspective really showcases uh, I, I think it's it's so much more powerful asking questions than kind of like trying to convince somebody why you're a good a good lawyer for you know like <laughs> that's just right. a much better way of doing you know, it. And not only that, but but it it I think it it sort of gives a reality check to a lot of clients mm. who who have built this memory in their head. I mean, because, you know, most of our clients are impaired, right? And, yeah, and they yeah. don't have the best memory of events, but they think they do. 
Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and they want it, they have hyper focused on several things through the night that probably really don't even matter to the defense of a DWI. Yeah. But that's all they want to focus on. And, and as you ask these probing questions and you try to get them to give you a chronological sequence of who said what and who did what in what order that night, they realize, you know. Ah, uh, I maybe you know. There's probably a pretty good reason I don't remember this very well, um, you know. Or they tell you this incredibly detailed series of events that then doesn't match the video, yeah, or doesn't match yeah. the reports, and and then you you go to them and what? Wh why did you think this? Why did you tell me this? What what was going on? And and so I think a lot of clients think they have been wrongly accused and pressing on them to get details that they either can't give you or they give you wrong details makes it easier then to talk to them about a plea or a resolution down the road yeah. because they've got sort of a reality check as to, you know, that night. Yeah, you, you were mentioning earlier about, you know, <clears throat> you know, it's your practice to get the discovery and, and video um, and, uh, you know, kind of maybe po pointing out that there, there is um, that's not, not everybody's practice. And I, I think, you know, I would just take a minute here based on what you just said to really encourage people to get the discovery on a DWI case, um, you know, get, get the notes, review those. You just never know what's going to come up in those. I mean, there's, there's been so many cases that I thought we were dead. Like, I mean, there's just, just like, you know, the call comes in person's like, I couldn't remember anything. Couldn't tell you what happened. Um, you know, and then there's the, you know, whatever the issue is, something pops up in the, in the discovery, um, on the video end in particular, I think that that can build so much trust with the client because basically from the client's perspective, this thing that happened is is off of you know an officer who has arrested and put them in handcuffs memory and that's it like that's the entire like a case that is is built up and so you know they're trying to figure out should i trust my lawyer's opinion of of this case you know he wasn't there like you know does, doesn't know what was uh what was going on he didn't see me that night so i think when you have that video and you sit down with your client good or bad the video is so powerful in terms of getting client buy-in into what action that you take, whether that's, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, Hey, this is a case I think we could, we could, you know, take to trial, you know, successfully, ultimately, obviously your choice, but this is, this is a good case or on the flip side, like there's just, I'm not, I'm not seeing much, but when you're looking at that evidence together, it really creates a, a much more uh, strong buy-in into what what the the outcome is. So I I, I uh, yeah couldn't encourage enough people getting that discovery back on DWI cases. I think it's malpractice not to. I mean, I, you know, the, the the videos are so powerful, and I can't tell you the number of videos I've gotten that don't match the written reports of the officers mm -hmm. oh, for, for sure. whatever reason. Yeah, either. Yeah. Either there's just, I mean, I, I tried one about two months ago in Elizabeth City and the officer attributed some statements to my client, to my Hispanic client who doesn't speak English. But, you know, it was a wreck case and my client wasn't in the vehicle and, and it was in the in a field, uh, not near a road somehow or another. And the, the report had my client speaking in English, apparently, because the officer understood him well enough to say that he had told him what road he had been on and that he was the driver and where he had been. And you watch the video and it's nothing like that ever yeah, said. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the, it, it, you know, from one extreme to another, or the client's hell bent on a trial and beating this yeah. thing and falsely accused and you send them the video and follow up. Did you watch the video? I watched about two minutes and then I couldn't watch anymore. Uh, you know, and so they, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> one of my, one of my favorite memories is uh, watching a video with a client and I had watched this ahead of time. And I was just like, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep it together while we sit down and watch this video. It's so absurd. Like the things that he's saying and the way that he looks. And again, this was like one of those phone calls where, you know, on the front end of things, it's like, I've been wrongfully accused. Like I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't that bad. So we sit down and I'm like, you know, I'm saying prayers, like, please let me, you know, keep this together. And almost within like 
seconds, he just bursts out laughing. And so like from downstairs, you know, my, my assistant can hear like both of us just like howling, you know, upstairs at some of the things that he's saying and yeah, mo- moved into a plea rather quickly after that. But it is one of those, those, uh, yeah, powerful come to reality check moments that, that you get to see with that video. And I don't know about your practice, but in district court here, you know, the, the video has become so accepted and, and I utilize it so much that it's almost a self authenticating document that yeah. I can just play bits and pieces of, and I don't have to go through a bunch of headache, getting it admitted and playing various parts or playing all of it, you know, I, so it's very easy to use. The judges want to see it. Uh, our chief district court judge reminds the prosecutors all the time. It's like, y'all got this law passed. And, you know, because it was it was initially, you know, if truth be told, it was to protect the officers against yes. false claims. Yeah. And so yeah. and so <laughs> the judge says, y'all wanted it. Now y'all got to live with it. And, <laughs> and uh, because it's so often you know, in cases that I try, I'm trying them because I've got irrefutable video evidence. And, you know, I can show that the HGN wasn't done in accordance with his training, or I can show that the clues he wrote for the walk and turn weren't present, or I can show that my client wasn't slurring. I mean, you can't fake those things on the video. And so it, it works well. Yeah, t- totally agree. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's such a great tool, and I would say underutilized tool. I mean, it's it's just something that can be so powerful in your case assessment, in client buy in, and actually attacking the chart. I mean, there's just so much value to that to that video. Hey, podcast listeners, I want to briefly interrupt today's episode to invite you to join me at the inaugural Freedom Fighter Summit in Asheville this October. This in person only event is designed for growth-minded lawyers determined to take their criminal defense practice to the next level. Due to the size of the summit's venue, there are a limited number of seats available. Don't miss out on the incredible lineup of speakers and spectacular networking opportunity that this summit provides. For more details, visit www.minniclaw.com forward slash summit. Enter the promo code NCDWIGUY all lowercase, all one word at checkout for $150 off your summit ticket. Look forward to seeing you there. Now back to the show. Kind of moving into like trial preparation. Uh, You know, uh, what, what is what, as you're kind of gearing up for a trial, what are some of the things that you are doing from like a, you know, kind of 10,000 foot view perspective, getting ready for a trial? Well, you know, I, I view these things like a chain and, if, and I'm just trying to break a link of the chain anywhere that I can. Mm-hmm. And so I start by looking at the stop and for, for two things. Number one, was it a lawful stop? Uh, did, did the officer actually see any violation of a rule of the road or, you know, if it's an accident? Um, you know, going back, I think it was 96 or 97, 98 in that time frame. Uh, I actually did the appeal for Peter Tappy. So state versus Tappy was the was the case that stands for the proposition. It's not a stop when your client sees the officer making a U-turn behind him and just pulls over voluntarily to wait on the officer. And so hmm. we we uh, we were challenging the stop and the Court of Appeals told us that that's not even a stop. And so you can't challenge that. But so I'm always, you know, I'm looking at the stop and I'm I'm looking to see, was it a lawful stop? And even if it was, was it indicative of impairment? You know, there's 24 yeah. clues that the, the law enforcement officers are trained could be indicative of uh, driving behavior, indicative of impairment. Speeding is not one of them. Right. And so anytime you have a pure speeding stop, uh, then you have no indication of impairment up until that point. Uh, And so then if you get a case with refuse everything and only stop for speeding, that's a really good probable cause case because they have no clues other than maybe red and glassy eyes, you know, which NHTSA, you know, did away with years ago, maybe an odor. Um, But 
you know, and, and maybe slurred speech, maybe some balance issues, but no field sobriety tests and speeding. That's a, that's a pretty good case to try. Uh, but so then I'm looking at the stop. If, if it's bad, then I'll file a motion to suppress on the stop. Then I'm looking at probable cause to arrest after that. You know, statements by the client, field sobriety test. I'm, I'm a certified administrator of the standardized field sobriety test. And so I dissect those heavily um, to see whether they're done right or not. Watch the client on the video uh, and then look at the other ancillary crimes that are charged and were those sufficient in and of themselves to warrant an arrest or uh, an intoxilizer test even without pc for impairment uh and so you know looking at all that and so those are those are typically my motions to suppress now lately i've had a run and i don't know it's just i think it's just random 28 years i hadn't really run across this but i've had four or five of them recently where I'm filing a motion to suppress a blood test because they take them to the intoxilizer room, they read them their intoxilizer rights, they either get poor performance on the test, so they mark them as a refusal, or they get an outright refusal. And then my client says, well, you can draw blood, or the officer says, well, can we draw your blood instead? Mm -hmm. And they don't re-advise on the rights and they have to there's there's a couple cases out there about that and so then they get this really high blood test but it's no good because they don't have a search warrant they don't have a re-advisement of the rights and so i've had several uh blood tests suppressed lately just based on that single issue um and, and it's to the point now where the prosecutor's office knows all about it and they'll just stipulate that the blood's no yes. good and in a couple of cases, that's dispositive. And in a couple of cases, the you know, they can still try it on appreciable impairment. And so it really doesn't make a big difference except as to the uh limited driving privilege, which you know yeah, used you get to that be interlock. Used, yeah, it used to be I mean, you didn't really deal. want an interlock, but yeah. now, you know, <laughs> now it's now sort of <laughs> yeah, now you might want an interlock because yeah. it's unlimited driving yeah. anywhere, anytime, any reason, any you know, so yeah. Uh, I've had several clients under 0.14 who have opted for the interlock just so they can drive it whenever, yeah. however, wherever they want. But so that's kind of how I look at it. I'm sort of stop PC and all that involves. And then, you know, the breath testing and the blood testing. And um, I tend to win most cases on PC. Um not so much the stop, although, you know, you win some every now and then. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, talking about PC and video, one of the issues that I've, I've really been struggling with recently as I get more and more video and watch more and more video, you know, the statute says that the officers can only consider positive or negative for alcohol on the Alka sensor. Mm. And these videos, especially when there's multiple officers involved in the arrest, you will hear the officers discussing between themselves or oftentimes even with the client what the client blew on the Alka sensor. Uh, and I've, I've got one case right now where early on in the in the investigation process, the two officers are talking and they're predicting to each other based on their first conversation with the client they're predicting what the alka sensor blow is going to be, except they're off by a decimal. They're 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 guessing 0.3 or 0.4, and and so they go give the guy the alka sensor before any field sobriety test, which is a problem in and of itself. And they they say, look, the legal limit's 0.8, and if you blow less than 0.8, we're going to let you drive. And so he tries to blow, tries to blow, tries to blow, and finally get a blow. And they're like, oh, man, you blew a 0.9. And of course, it's 0.09. But so then they go back and they're like, man, I didn't think he was going to blow that high. I, I didn't think he was that bad off. And so then they take him off camera and do the three field sobriety test. And lo and behold, all the clues are present on yeah. all the field sobriety tests that we can't see because they're off camera. But what we do see is a sober looking guy 
with no slurred speech and no problem standing there talking to the officers who admitted to one drink with dinner an hour ago. And they're predicting, you know, what they meant to be a 0.03 or 0.04. Yeah. And then, and then after these suspect field sobriety tests, they, they come back to the officer with the camera and they give him another PBT and they tell him again, after those field sobriety tests with all those clues that, if you blow less than 0.8, you're a hundred percent driving home. And he blows another 0.09 yeah, yeah, and they yeah. arrest him. And so the, the dilemma is I want to show the judge the video of all of that. But in showing the judge that, I've got to let the judge hear the number that they end up talking about. And how many judges are really going to be able to unring that bell? And so, you know, I'm struggling with, you know, how how do I show the judge what really happened here and that he was arrested only because of a 0.09 on the ALK sensor without showing the judge the 0.09? And so that's sort of more of a technical practice issue, but it it's uh it's interesting. I've talked about it with a few people and don't really have any good answers uh other than just telling the judge, judge, it is your duty to disregard the number except in this instance where I'm showing they violated the statute. And so we'll see if that works or not. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think, I know, think one of the things that I've kind of thought through and I was just pulling up 20 dash 16.3, um, the, uh, uh, PBT PBT statute. Um, and, and that section D there use of screening tests, uh, or, or refusal by officer, and the language says the fact that a driver showed a positive or negative result on any alcohol screening test, but not the actual alcohol concentration result or a driver's refusal to submit may be used by a law enforcement officer uh, uh, or may be used by an administrative agency in determining if there are reasonable grounds for believing the driver has committed an implied consent offense. And, and what, what I've kind of argued under that um, section is that you know, and, and, and also, um, I'm trying to remember what the, the name of the case is that, um, interpreted that, uh, is it, is That's it over the one where he backed into the motorcycle? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Over rocker. Yeah. So, Overrocker. you know, That's they, right. they, 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 you know, basically it seems to me the, the language of the court and over rocker says, you know, it's not just a problem, like, uh, like a part problem. If you use that, PBT, like you, you could resurrect it with, you know, some other field sobriety tests. The the way that the the court that I interpret the court is that basically if the number is used in the uh, uh officer's PC analysis, it really kind of is at least a presumption of of you know uh, bad PC. Like I mean, you know, maybe it could be could be overcome, be. but I I I think a lot of judges are, are like, well he did say that he used the PBT or he did tell the office or he did tell the, the uh, suspect the number on video, but then he said he was also, ba- you know, and, and I think that there's this like kind of like balancing or juggling that's going on. It's like, now the way that the court seems to interpret this is that you shouldn't be using that number and making your arrest decision whatsoever. I agree. And it's why NHTSA trains these officers not to do the PBT until they have formed their opinion of PC and then only to confirm that the impairing substance is alcohol. Because, you know, if you're an officer, you're only human and you see a a 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, and then you start doing field sobriety tests, how much more likely are you to see clues that you might not have objectively seen if you didn't know, you know, that number? Yeah. And so, you know, I try to bring in all of that whenever I'm whenever I'm arguing that issue. But but I haven't really developed a technique that I'm comfortable with yet to show the judge the scenario I just I just told you about and trusting the judge to ignore the number and rule like I want him to. I I just I'm not comfortable with that yet, but it's something that that's. I've got to figure out. Yeah, I, I, uh, it, it is, it is a strange, a strange space because you're to some extent arguing that the fact that the officer used a point one two to make their arrest decision 
should mean there's no PC. <laughs> That's really exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so it, it, it is, it is tough. I mean, I, I definitely think from a um, kind of like less, less numeric result orientation, you know, the, just the common sense uh, that you were just pointing out of like, basically um, finding the uh, going from the answer to, to working the problem, right? Like you, you, you get the answer first, the PVT, and then you go and do your, you know, your, your, uh, homework, you, you do your HGN and, and walk and turn and one like stand. And, um, you know, I mean, it, and it's a, I, I think that's why it's so powerful to like drill deep into, into NHTSA and talk about how, um, you know, the NHTSA program is developed, you know, the, the, you know, basically kind of from the outset of your cross-examination, kind of using the officer to build up the NHTSA training. You went through this, this course, it was very scientific, wasn't it? It was very calculated. Um, you know, did the instructor present all these things in a, in a very specific way where you tested on these things? Because then every deviation from that um, training material becomes basically the officer's uh, decision to take shortcuts. And that really is what the PBT, you know, while the person's sitting in the driver's seat is, is it's a shortcut. It's basically, do I want to spend the next 20 minutes dealing with this person on the side of the road and having them run through tests, or can I just let them drive on? Right. Like, I mean, that's, that's a lot of ways what's, what's happening with that. And so it's, it's laziness that in most of these situations causes so that. That's it. And I've had officers tell me, you know, when they when I can see them giving the PBT first, you know, are you trained to give the PBT first or last? And and they want to start hedging and I have to bring out the manual. And I don't know about it in your district, but in my district, I can pretty freely use the mm -hmm. the manual. You know, the officer says, Yeah, I was trained according to NHTSA. And they say, Yeah, that appears to be the NHTSA manual, and then I can do whatever I want to with it. Um, you know, and, and when I get to the point where it says after, they're like, yeah, well, our department doesn't like us on the side of the road any longer than we need to be. So it's really an officer safety issue. Yeah. And, you know, so you hear all sorts of different things, but, um, it, it is, it was developed that way by NHTSA for a very good reason. And, um, it really aggravates me when judges, you know, turn a blind, blind eye to that. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think even to that, even to that point, because I, I see the same thing quite a bit, where, you know, they'll just do the PBT, or or maybe they'll do the HGN and the PBT, but kind of skip the other, and and you know the, uh, again, the excuse is, well, you know, we weren't we we weren't on the right type of terrain, or it was, um, uh, you know, it wasn't wasn't uh, level, or or you know. Uh, I, the, again, we were really close to the road. I was worried about the the person falling over, but but it's kind of like again when you go back to the manual, it's like well these examples exist, and so you know you take that into account in terms of the results that you're seeing from those tests. If you're on you know an incline, I think that's the way to build it up from the defense side of things. Is that you know th these these type of situations were contemplated by NHTSA, and there uh, you know th there's very few times where NHTSA just says like this isn't an appropriate test, right? Like you've got you know uh, leg and and uh, inner ear uh, inner ear problems, being overweight. Like you've got some of these things that. Do, do, do people kind of indicate, you know, like we, we shouldn't be doing this test, but at the, uh, at the, for most of them, it's just kind of like, take that into account. So, you know, maybe you give the benefit of the doubt to the defendant, if that's what's going on, but you give the no benefit of the doubt to the defendant. If you just put them in handcuffs, like I mean, that's, that's basically like right. the, uh, right. exactly. <laughs> you know, it is so easy to to charge and prosecute and get a conviction in a DWI. I mean, the, the system is completely set up against the defendant. And I, I argued this to a judge uh, at a Superior Court motion to suppress, and the prosecutor played the whole video of the four and a half minute investigation before arrest. And the judge took us back in the chambers and said, that guy wasn't drunk. That guy looked totally sober to me. And he's like, this is BS and blah, but he didn't want to rule for me. He yeah. just, he just didn't want to rule for me. Yeah. And it's been 
four months now and there's still no order yet, even though he's indicated he's going to grant my motion. The order's not there yet. But but I looked at him. I said, Judge, it's so easy to prosecute a DWI. They get yeah. so many convictions. It's so hard to defend one of these things. Why is it such a big deal when you say it's BS? What are we doing? Yeah. No, and he's like, oh, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, it's it's difficult, and you know, it it's difficult. very frustrating as a lawyer when you when you can prove violations of the statutes and the training procedures and the regulations, and and you get a judge that just doesn't care. They yeah, all they want to yeah. know is was he was that person the driver and what did they blow, and that's yeah, all they want. Yeah, know. that's the and, two facts, and that's that's just. That's unfair. It, it, it's 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 strange to me. And I understand how big a deal DWI is. When I was a senior in high school in Radcliffe, Kentucky, my small town had the biggest DWI fatality in history when a busload of kids were coming back from an amusement park and the drunk driver was driving the wrong way on the interstate, hit the bus head on, the bus exploded and 27 people were killed. I mean, there, there's books been written about. It. I mean, that's part of my childhood. I get how important DWI prosecution is, but at the same time, you know, these these people are normal people. They have rights, and it, it you know, <laughs> it's interesting to me that that it's tougher for a prosecutor to dismiss or reduce a DWI than it is a murder. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they have to fill out a lot more paperwork. They have to answer a lot more questions. Uh, they've got people keeping stats on them. And, you know, our, the first district has a policy, no reductions, period. Just yeah. they tr try it and the state loses, the state loses, but we're not reducing. I don't care how strong a defense you have or how bad an investigation this was. Uh, and, and I, you know, no one asked me my opinion, but I have a I have a real problem with that. That, yeah, that I, just I doesn't. That's yeah. not fair. Yeah, not no, fair. I, yeah, that's. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's a actual written policy, but uh, unwritten policy is the same in Buncombe as is. You know, basically, there's no, you know, there's no reduction. I mean, we've we've had a couple of times here where literally there's nothing in the blood and uh, like zero, like no drug, no 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 substances whatsoever, and the state's like, well. You know, we still may be able to show appreciation. It's like, no, there's nothing. There's like literally nothing. You know, nothing there. I mean, it's it's because of that kind of unspoken, uh, unspoken policy. You know, that or, or not unspoken, unwritten policy that you just you know not going to see a reduction. And I do think it's unfair because, again, even though every county is its own universe, it does seem kind of crazy that in some places, if there is a legitimate issue going on or certain uh, circumstances that need to be taken into account, there should be some prosecutorial discretion to be able to, to deal with that. And that uh, really is, yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel like a, a fair, a fair, uh, situation if if you're not kind of have that that leeway on the other side of the table um i know i know you've got to get get running here in just a, a minute danny so so maybe i can ask you this to uh kind of wrap up our conversation um with the uh you know 28 plus years of experience um if you could give a, a piece of advice to to young lawyers that are kind of uh wetting their toes into the dwi world what would uh what would that look like Listen to your client, but don't craft your defense based on what your client tells you. Get the discovery and watch it uh, and charge accordingly. You know, the, I, I don't know about in your area, but here we have a number of lawyers who who take DWIs at heavily discounted attorney's mm -hmm. fees rates uh, and never try a case. Yeah. And it, you know, it is, it's night and day different and, you know, just hand holding someone in court on a guilty plea and letting the state allege whatever factors they want versus actually taking the time and effort and research to, to fight a DWI and, and you need to charge accordingly. And, you know, 
The other thing is that I found, at least around here, and I've never practiced anywhere except Northeastern North Carolina, but at least here, don't be afraid to talk to the officers. You know, they they are as worried about being embarrassed on the stand as as anything. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, a lot of times, you know, if you can pull the manual out and say, hey, here's the video, here's what you did, here's what the manual says, I don't really want to get into any spots with you on the stand, you know, but here's what's coming. If you want to admit it, we'll just move on from it and, you know, be done with it. Uh, and a lot of times I'll, I'll have, I'll have officers prepped in advance. And when the prosecutor says, did you administer the HGN in accordance with your training? They'll say, no, no, it was really cold. Wow. And, and yeah. we just, you know, because, you know, you, you got to do 14 passes. It's got to take a minimum of 82 seconds. And, you know, on the video, even if you can't see the test, you can hear the audio and you know when the yes. officer starts and when they move to VGN, they tell you right now, I'm going to go up. Don't don't move your head. And so, you know, you get into a situation where you're dealing with a 25 second or a 30 second HGN. There's no possible way they could have given yeah. it in accordance with their training. And so, you know, they, they don't want to be embarrassed by that. They would they would simply just say, no, I didn't. And then the prosecutor knows to move on and the court can't consider a bad HGN and you've not made an enemy. And so th those are the things, you know, do your homework, watch the watch the video, compare it to the written report, charge appropriately and talk to the officers. You know, that those would be my four tips. Yeah, I, I love all those. I would say specifically the talking to the officer and uh, something that I, I've I've done really more uh, questioning of the officer in my practice in terms of trying to kind of get them locked into what they're going to say is so so that I could potentially if they get on the stand be like you know didn't you just tell me moments ago X you know whatever it might be but I haven't done what you've suggested now a couple of times during our call which is really to try to resolve the issue before it ever arises. And I do think that that's very powerful because it's a guarantee versus leaving it in the discretion of the judge. But also, like you just said, you don't burn those bridges with the officers because the only other alternative is to make the officer look like an idiot on the stand, which you know may feel kind of s somewhat uh, 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 you know, good in the moment. I mean, it, it might it might be like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lawyering well, but in the long run, I think that really is going to hurt you um, in terms of being able to ne negotiate pleas in the future, be able to get information from the officers in the future. The more that you can have those open conversations with with officers, um, to me, the better. You're going to get more information. You're going to get more buy-in. They're going to know you're not, you know, you're not like going to hang them out to dry. Like there, there really is, I think, a powerful. That doesn't always have to be this person is on the other side. I think that um, one of the best things that we do as defense lawyers is improve officers' investigations. Like at the end of the day, if we, you know, lose a case, but the officer goes out and investigates better the next time, then we've done our kind of job in terms of like kind of a, a public role that we have in the justice system. So I, I really love that um, that last point. Um, you know, when you go to them and you have the manual and and you're like, okay, the here's the video if you want to watch it, but here's what it shows. They're not suspect of your motives, and right. they're not they're, they're not paranoid about you tricking them in any way. Yeah, you know, you're just saying, okay, here it is. You know, this is what you were supposed to do, and you didn't do it, and I don't want to get into that with you. And so, you know, just yeah, that's yeah, that's basically powerful. fess up, and we'll move on, and. And I, I have seen that they really appreciate that to yeah. the point that a lot of them now, when I bring them out in the hallway, they're like, what I screw up on. You know? and, <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, it's not what I'm about, yeah. but, you know. yeah. but everybody's so human. Anyway. I mean, that's going to happen. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, well, well, I appreciate it very much, Danny. I'm gonna have to get you back on the podcast before too long because there's all kind of fun things that we could uh, talk about. But again, very much appreciate having you on. This has been, been a fun conversation. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. I appreciate it.